Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you for joining our second innovation workshop of Genesis 2022. We're joined by um, James Evans and Laura Letts from EY, and they will be discussing in today's disruptive healthcare environment, how will medtech transform? So they're going to be giving you an overview of the medtech industry's performance in 2021 and 2022, taking a deep dive into the macroeconomic uh, headwinds, operational challenges and opportunities for transformation that the industry will face in the near future. So just a few logistics before we get going. If you don't mind keeping your microphones on mute and your cameras off throughout the discussion, that would be great. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we will pick those up towards the end of the session. So I'm going to hand you over to James and Laura and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you and uh, thank you all for dialing in. And um, this uh, presentation is um, really from our Pulse of the Industry report on um, the medtech medical devices sector. Um, which we publish at EY every year um, in line with the MedTech Conference, formerly the Avamed Conference, which happens uh, in America in the autumn. And we, we published this report going back to 2007, um, just prior to the, the big financial crisis in 2008. Um, and each year we, we sort of looked at how the industry has coped with um, the, the broader operating environment, um, how medical device companies have been performing in terms of uh, their financials, um, the financing environment, m and and the main metrics like that. Um, and we've also tried to look at some of the, the main themes and, and currents within the industry each year and uh, get expert opinion in to, to speak to some of those subjects. So that's a, a part of the industry report, which uh, you can look up online. And uh, today we're going to walk through some of the findings from this year's paper. And um, I, I should say, when we, as we start, that in our definition of medtech, we, we've defined it quite broadly um, because some people can find medical devices more to the therapeutic device segment, um, which we cover, but we also look at um, diagnostics companies, um, imaging diagnostics for the, the big three imaging companies, and also, which is which is probably more unusual, we include uh, laboratory equipment and research-based companies. So the the Thermo Fishers of this world are also within our um, our med tech buckets. Um, just for just for clarity, because obviously people will define the margins of the industry a bit differently. But that's our our version of med tech. We define it for this paper. So um, without further ado, let me spin on to the content. And um, I should introduce uh, my colleague, Laura Leck, who's a tax director working with businesses in the health sciences and wellness sector. And I myself am a, a senior analyst in uh, EY Knowledge, also working across the health sciences and wellness sector. So medtech and biopharma, payers and providers, all the major parts of the life sciences and health segments. And um, I'm going to now hand over to Laura, who's going to talk you through some of the, the metrics that we've captured in this year's report around the industry's performance. Laura. Thanks, James. Um, so I guess if we flip on a slide, James, let's start with um, some of the key highlights from our report this year. Um, we shared last year that public medtech revenues had surpassed half a trillion dollars for the first time in 2021. And this was really driven by deferred elective procedures and ongoing sales of pandemic related products. And though many medtechs are yet to really correct their course on revenue growth trajectory since the pandemic began, the industry's overall growth has been 16%. And this is levels that we haven't seen since we began publishing the Pulse of the Industry report back in 2007. In 2021, COVID-19 was the huge revenue driver. Um, but in 22, the data so far suggests that revenue growth is really starting to normalise back to recent historical averages of around 6%. And we've seen medtech stocks peak uh, towards the end of 21, and we've seen some drop off in 22. And this will probably come as no surprise, but it is far less dramatic than the drop off we've seen in the biotech sector. So the medtech sector is really um, being quite resilient given market conditions. Across 21 and 22, total financing has fallen by about 
um, and you know, financing levels with innovation capital are down to nearly 10 billion across the sector. It'll be no surprise that we've seen IPO and SPAC markets decline uh, towards the end of 21, and that's really been across the board. But we've also seen VC funding um, remain relatively robust, which I think is a good sign for the industry. And this, this does mean that smaller med techs access to the public markets looks a little bit more constrained in 22 compared to 21, but it's good to see that VC funding may still be available. And in line with those public markets, we've also seen M&A activity muted in the first half of 22 after really high levels of activity in 21. So if we get into a bit more detail on some of these findings, if you can move on for me, Jane. Thank you. So the industry recorded 16% revenue growth in 21 and double digit increase in R&D spending. And this is a real healthy sign of confidence in, and I think the commitment to the industry's ability to keep innovating. And it's worth noting that the revenue growth is the highest since the financial crisis in 2007. Revenues have uh, largely been driven by the return to deferred elective procedures, as I mentioned, and also the ongoing sale of pandemic related products, for example, diagnostic and research related lab equipment. And it really remains to be seen whether MedTech can sustain this impressive performance despite the challenges of 22. And we will come on to some of those challenges shortly. If we move on, James. So coming back to that 16% growth uh, that we saw, um, I mentioned that the sector suppressed, surpassed half a trillion dollars in 21, which was an amazing achievement. And this 16% growth rate represents the fifth consecutive year of growth and a huge increase over the 6% that was actually recorded in 2020. And it's worth noting that every segment of the industry has been performing strongly here. We've seen pure plays, both commercial and emerging leaders, outperform their 2020 growth at 16 and 13 percent versus just five and 10 percent back in 2020. And we've also seen conglomerates deliver 16 percent growth versus just eight percent back in 2020. And across the sector, we've seen 70 percent of all conglomerates and 80 percent of all pure plays grow their annual revenues. If we look at geographies, uh, US, ba US based companies increased their revenues by 20 percent and European companies by that 11 percent. Abbott had the noticeable uh, biggest top line increase up 7.4 billion or 33%. And that's really been driven by the rapid diagnostic business. And we've also seen Thermo Fisher Scientific um, adding 7 billion. So they were the second largest growth um, up 22% on revenue. And in all, I think we saw 14 companies increase their top line by over a billion in the last 12 month period. It's worth noting, though, that whilst we saw top line growth, um, this didn't universally translate into profitable growth. Only 50 percent of companies actually saw their bottom line grow. But part of the reason for this is that the companies we're looking at have continued to invest in the future. We've seen 71 percent increase in their R&D spending, uh, 10 by over 100 million. And despite the recent war for talent, 77 percent of med techs we looked at have managed to increase headcount with over 22 companies adding more than a thousand employees in the period. So I think some really interesting um, facts there, given the market conditions we're seeing, we're still seeing really strong growth um, and the industry is very much still innovating. If we move on, James. So if we look at the revenue growth across product classes, we can see that the diagnostic sector led this growth, um, but this is really extended across all sectors. The therapeutics devices, which is by far the largest market segment, grew by 11%. And the other three industry segments all recorded growth of over 20%, with non-imaging diagnostics leading them all um, up 26% in the last 12 months. Non-imaging diagnostics have really gained considerable attention um, as an enabler in precision, precision medicine and remote care. And the segment's robust performance in 21 was really driven by a huge global need for COVID-19 testing capacity. So I think there's a question to what extent the industry's um, outstanding performance in 21 reflects a one-off impact of the pandemic or whether we'll see this on an ongoing basis for future growth. And I think only time will tell for that. If we move on, Jess. So as I've just mentioned, the therapeutic devices segment is by far the largest segment. It represents 61% of total pure play industry revenues in 21. And this is despite having undergone a slight contraction in 2020 by about 
The 11% growth we've seen in 21 um, has seen this segment hit 195 billion as the post-COVID recovery in elective procedures has driven major revenue growth. And that's across areas such as orthopedic and dental, which we've seen increased by 26 and 17% respectively in 21. And all five of the largest therapeutic areas have recorded revenue growth of at least 16%. And among companies driving this increase were um, the likes of Stryker with their orthopedic therapeutic areas, uh, recording about 19% growth, um, which equated to about 2.8 billion. Um, Boston Scientific in the cardiovascular and vascular area were up 2 billion or 20%. And Align Technology in the dental market added 1.5 billion, which was up 60%. And as we look to the future, if we look at analysis of the first half of 22, revenue suggests growth is now normalising back to recent historical averages rather than continuing on the um, pandemic fuel trajectory that we've seen over the last year. And while 92% of industry leaders have seen revenue increases through 21, with an average growth rate of about 16%, only 68% of the same group witnessed continued growth in the first half of 22, with the average increase dropping to just over 6%. So this is really coming back to the growth we were seeing pre-pandemic and what we would typically expect in the industry. We can move on. So I've mentioned growth, but what about market valuations? We saw the industry stock performance uh, peak towards the end of 21, and we saw some incredible valuations of businesses going to market. And at the start of 22, medtech commercial leaders were up about 47% on their composite stock price from the start of 20. Um, and while non-commercial leaders were up about 119%, so really high valuations at that stage. But towards the end of July 22, the equivalent numbers have fallen to about 14% and 54% respectively reflecting the broader investor uncertainties and the heightening macroeconomic turmoil that we're seeing in the market. So whilst MedTech continues to outperform the broader indices, the industry um, is really seen as a potential safe haven in the short term and a real growth engine in the long term. So I don't think we're going to see a turn away from this industry in terms of investors coming to market, but just the growth rates are coming down slightly. Can we move on, James? So we shared this time last year when we launched our previous report that R&D spend and M&A activity was up. And in fact, in 21, we saw commercial leaders deploy 84 billion of capital across R&D, M&A, as well as cash deployed to shareholders. And the industry spent well above the previous decade average across these three areas, indicating really high levels of capitalization in the sector. 22 billion was directed towards R&D, uh, which is well above the past decade average of about 13 billion and up 16% on the previous year, which is a good sign of the industry's commitment to the long-term organic innovation. A huge 39.3 billion was directed towards M&A deal making, with inorganic growth still playing a key role in the industry strategy. And this compares to pandemic driven uh, 3.6 billion in our previous Pulse report. The following period, the 21 to 22 period that we're looking at now, has seen a surge of 995%, uh, with total comfortably surpassing the past decade average of 25.4 billion. Um, in terms of shareholders and the cash return to them, 2.8 billion uh, was returned in the form of dividends and stock buyback, um, which is slightly more than deployed on R&D, which I think was surprising for that period. And this represents a 42% increase over the previous period which again was way higher than the previous um, past decade average. In its current cash rate state, MedTech could be expected to deploy more capital in each of these areas going forward. And it'll be interesting to see what we um, see over the next 12 months. We move on to So I've touched on revenue growth, uh, market valuations and spend, but what about regulatory approvals? In uh, 2022 is on track to see the highest number of US FDA 510k clearances in over a decade. Uh, we've seen 1,800 approvals in the first six months of this year, compared to just under 3,000 in the whole of 21. And this surge is likely to be a result of the FDA negotiating a backlog of filings that have really accumulated through the pandemic. Um, the number of pre-market approvals was also relatively low in 2021. Uh, just 31 was approved altogether. And 2022 is on course to even see an even lower number um, based on data to date. Although I think the industry is hoping that given the recent surge in the 510k clearances, 
that we might see this replicated in the pre-market approvals towards the end of the year. Um, and again, this is just as the industry works through the pandemic driven backlog. Can we move on, Jay? I mentioned at the outset that we'd seen a real drop off in the IPO and SPAC markets towards the end of 21. And in fact, capital raised uh, dropped for the second consecutive year down 30% to 30 billion, which is well below the past decade average. Um, among the four financing vehicles that we can see on the slide there, debt saw the smallest decline, dropping just half a percent to 11.1 billion. Equity financing has fallen by about 40% to just under 19 billion, with follow on public offerings dropping 61%, and the IPO market declining 39% both from a very strong performance during the previous 12 months. Venture is down 7%, but I think this should be seen in context because actually 8.5 billion of VC in 21-22 was still the second highest in a decade. So as I mentioned at the outset, we are seeing venture um, as a strong financing um, area for this market. And there's really a tale of two halves when we look at this period. Um, financing levels dropped sharply in the second half of the period. Um, which is the first part of 22. Um, and that's really as public markets started to tighten. 70% um, of total capital raise came in the first half of the period we're looking at, and 49% was in the first quarter alone. The IPO markets have raised 4.4 billion, but 98% of IP value was generated in the first half. So again, real tale of two halves in terms of what we've seen across 21 and 22. And I think MedTechs, who may have gone public, um, looking at 22 as their go year, have really um, started to pull rein that in. We've seen a lot less public offerings, um, and now MedTech's very much are looking at how do I fund and, and um, increase my cash runway to make sure that I'm ready to go when the markets pick up, but now is not the right time. So if we look at VC investment, Around 36% or 8.5 billion um, of venture capital raised across the period came from early stage funding rounds. Uh, the vast majority of the biggest venture rounds in the last 12 month period went to late stage companies with a few notable exceptions, including Ultima, um, Ultima's Genomics, which raised 600 million. And that was to enable it to scale up its sequencing products. And neuro neurology focused med techs were heavily represented among the top venture targets with four of the biggest of the 10 rounds going to companies in this space. And this has included the brain chip startup Neuralink, which was co-founded by Elon Musk um, and has investors such as Alphabet. Other notable rounds that I think worth mentioning here are the drug delivery um, specialist Enable Injections. They're developing a Sanofi-backed wearable, um, which is a subcutaneous drug delivery system. Um, Apijet, which received 590 million um, from the US International Development Finance Corporation during the pandemic, um, and that was to manufacture 3 billion pre filled syringes. And then Exoimaging developed a handheld ultrasound device using AI uh, to help triage ca ca cardiac patients. So, a couple of notable rounds there outside of the, the main uh, theme that we were seeing. We skip on, James. So if we look at where funding has really taken place, California has continued to dominate both VC and total equity raised, um, although the total of about 5.2 billion is well short of the 10.6 billion generated across the previous 12 months. Northern California accounted for 3.8 billion of this total, and Massachusetts raised 938 million of venture funds, making it comfortably the second largest US region for medtech venture capital in this period. We've also seen France and Israel being the next most prominent regions, raising 511 million and 487 million respectively. And in terms of total equity capital raised, Massachusetts was again uh, one of the top five with 1.3 billion, surpassed only by California, uh, the UK at 1.8 billion and Switzerland at 1.4 billion. So I don't think there's any surprises there. Uh, we typically see Northern California as a, uh, a hotbed for this type of capital. So can we move on? And finally, if we take a quick look at M&A performance over the period, we can see it's heavily concentrated in the first six months, with 22 showing a stabilisation back to lower levels of investment. The total M&A deal value amounted to 77 billion, with an average deal size of about 305 million, up 41% on the previous year, 
but still way below the past decade average. There were about 18 deals of more than a billion, um, and that's compared to 11 in the previous period. And we only saw one mega deal of over 10 billion, and that's the Baxter Hill Run deal in late 21. Of the non mega deals generated um, 64.6 billion, more than any previous year since we've tracked the industry's performance, and around 10% of all deals use some form of milestone payment. Similar to financing, the period under review is really a tale of two halves. We saw 70% of all dollar proceeds were spent in the first half of the period uh, in 21, while the second half has really seen a drop off back to levels that we would expect pre pandemic. And the discrepancy may be a result of macroeconomic factors, geopolitical factors, restraining MA, and with only time will tell um, on how quickly that can pick back up. Um, if we look at some of the uh, most active players in this space, uh, Medtronic and Boston Scientific were among um, those players. They both completed three deals each in this review period. Uh, I think that's um, where I'll leave it, James. So I think that's a summary of the, the key trends that we've seen in this period. Um, the medtech industry has really demonstrated a lot of resilience during the last 12 months. But there are undoubtedly a number of challenges now that they need to face, particularly with the um, the wider macroeconomic environment. And I'm going to pass to James now, who's going to talk us through some of those challenges. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And um, I think, as you said, it, it's definitely been. Um, uh, it, we, we published the report in autumn, so our data spreads um, from uh, basically July to June for most of our major metrics, as you can see there. And um, as Laura pointed out, you know, the, the 2022 um, financing, M&A and other metrics are, are really different to 2021. Um, and I think we did see a kind of huge rebound across 2021 from some of the activity that had been shuttered during the, the opening of the pandemic. Um, and I think that backlog has probably uh, largely spent itself now. And we've seen a, a bit of a reset uh, a correction not only in the valuations but in a lot of the the metrics that we look at across the sector that Laura has just walked us through there and and in terms of these macroeconomic factors that we, we keep mentioning I think most of them are pretty obvious and a lot of them are affecting um, industries the world over but but to call out specific things um, there is as Laura mentioned a, a bit of a rebound after having this uh, you know huge surge in diagnostics and not just in that but you know PPE and ventilators um, a lot of equipment that was um, in huge demand which now that is, is settled back a bit has you know ceased to provide an immediate driver for medtech revenues and um, more generally obviously there's there's inflation rising costs for um, very many of the inputs that medtech needs so it's, it's not just the raw materials and the electricity and and you know, the, the transport and freight, the, the supply chain costs, but also um, labour shortages, which is something we'll speak to a bit more later on. Um, and the, the exchange rate volatility is, is also an issue um, for the, the US-based companies, which, as you can see uh, from the metrics that Laura has walked us through, are, are, they're really the dominant, um, you know, centre of gravity in the industry. And, of course, they sell worldwide. And with the, the strength of the dollar, it, it's really... Um, eaten into their, their bottom lines because the, simply the, the, the currency exchange is so unfavorable against the dollar that there's overseas sales are not really, um, you know, bringing in as much as they as they have become accustomed to in the last couple of years. And um, we've got a, a quote here, I mean, this is, you know, a representative kind of statement, if you like. Um, I think because all the, the second quarter financial reporting, and we saw much of this in the third quarter as well, from the, the leading med tech companies mentioned the same things, which is um, the, the rise in cost, um, the, the drop off in, in revenues that were coming out of COVID specific things. And then also, you know, there's, there's still um, a trailing impact from COVID-19, not so much in the US and Europe specifically, as in uh, China with the zero COVID lockdowns and the impact that has uh, not on, just on the market in China, but also on uh, every aspect of logistics and supply chain that's uh, involved with China, which is something we'll talk about uh, a bit more in a moment. So looking at these uh, these broad trends, in the report we published this year, um, we, we called out certain areas where we think there's 
uh, you know, space for, for medtech to improve or to address existing challenges across the value chain. Um, and this goes from R&D, which is obviously the, the real engine of the industry. And we've seen, you know, companies are investing in it, but we suspect that, you know, R&D is still being viewed in a fairly traditional perspective relative to where healthcare delivery is at present. And that's something that companies will need to reconsider. Um, and then also, we've touched on this already, but the supply chain issues are, are ongoing. And that's something that's um, going to apply to talent and workforce as well. And these are going to be uh, specific challenges uh, in healthcare as well as in other sectors. And then, you know, more broadly at the other end of the value chain, we, we see opportunities for transformation um, in terms of how the industry connects with its customers and connects with patients as well. So all of its end users, uh, we feel that there's this space for a, a rethink in how the business model operates. And that's uh, something that's coming up a lot in conversations that we have with clients that we think is going to be on the agenda for MedTechs as we uh, move into the new year. Um, and in many ways, these are these are all things that are, they represent long-standing trends in a way. Uh, maybe the talent one is, is, is something that's really sprung up a, a lot more in the last year or so. But in general, these trends, they go back before COVID-19, but I think it has really helped to accelerate um, you know, some of the, the factors involved, like the, the increasing move towards uh, digital engagement with customers and with patients, um, the, the urgency of rethinking how R&D works, uh, supply chain challenges have all really been um, amplified by the disruption that we've had during the pandemic. And, you know, that's the, an ongoing thing. I think uh, while the, the immediate brunt of the pandemic has, has passed over for the moment, I, I think in terms of the effect on the operating model, we, we're still seeing all of these things as, as ongoing, um, you know, challenges and issues for the industry. So uh, I'll look at some of these in a little bit more detail um, and we'll sort of walk through the value chain as I've, as I've presented it here from, from the R&D side onwards. Um, in terms of R&D, we're very used to med tech being driven by uh, a, a system where you have small companies that develop a product or two products and they develop those over a relatively short product cycle of a couple of years which is, you know, it, it's long compared to tech companies, but it's very short compared to, for example, biopharma companies, where you have a much longer product cycle, um, a much more um, protracted uh, R&D phase with extensive clinical trials. Um, as Laura was pointing out, you know, most of the approvals that are coming into the market in med tech, um, looking at the FDA in America, it, they come through the 510K pathway, which is, the approval pathway for devices which are effectively uh, similar or comparable to existing devices. And it's a much more um, you know, concise pathway compared to the amount of filing that needs to go into either uh, a PMA, pre-market approval for a very novel device, or even more so for novel drugs, um, which as I say, involves extensive clinical development, time and cost. So that's, that's the traditional R&D model that we have. Um, whereby there's a, a, a huge ecosystem of companies developing one or two products and then making a rapid exit um, into acquisition uh, and gradually those products find their ways into the portfolios of some of the bigger players in the sector. And I think, you know, prior to COVID, we were actually starting to see a bit of a change in, in that model insofar as uh, because reimbursement has become such a big subject, uh, with, with drug pricing, but also with medical device uh, costing, there's, there's been a, a growing emphasis on not just do you have a product that will be approvable and will reach the market, but does it have uh, a likelihood of winning reimbursement? Is it going to generate commercial returns? And we believe that uh, big acquirers have started to consider those questions a lot more. And it's, it's actually slowed uh, probably the acquisition rate. And it's meant that smaller companies have had to function for longer. Um, as I say, in MedTech, I think they traditionally have been set up to you know, establish a product and then exit. And in fact, they've had to do more work before acquisition in, in the last couple of years. Um, I mean, the last couple of years prior to COVID here. 
um, to validate the um, the innovations that they've created and to demonstrate that there's a plausible reimbursement pathway, which has obviously meant that they need uh, whatever their burn rate, they need more operating cash to keep going for a longer period. They need a longer runway um, before making those exits. And then uh, Laura touched on this, but what we really saw during COVID was such a huge surge in life sciences valuations. And I think, you know, in part that's just due to cyclical investment and just the, the real uh, frontline focus that life sciences had during the pandemic. But for whichever reasons, you know, investors poured a huge amount of cash into um, biotech and medtech. And in 2021, the, the investment that was coming into the sector was really of a, a really unprecedented level. And we saw companies in, in medtech and in biotech being able to uh, successfully run IPOs and sometimes SPAC deals, where even though they had only one product or sometimes they were only en route to having a single product, they were able to go to the public markets and access capital. There was just real excitement for um, investing in these small companies. And so we saw a bit of a shift uh, with companies thinking less of M&A exits and more of let's make a, a you know, a, a play for public money. Let's uh, see if we can uh, get capitalization from, from private investors. And, uh, you know, all, all these different pathways became open to the smaller companies. And now I think we're seeing the kind of end of that phase and we're seeing a kind of drop off in those IPOs and SPACs. And we're back to this innovation needs to come from these smaller companies. Which is a you know a bit of a digression, but I think what we're hearing when we talk to clients is that innovation in terms of you, know, you create a product and that's it is not the way to think of it anymore for medtech. You know, it's it's not just going to be um, a single product. It's going to be the offering that it makes uh, in terms of a value contribution. And again, this is something that is probably more advanced with biopharma. You know, that we're now quite used to the idea that um, a, a new drug is going to be uh, judged on what value it can deliver and often that pricing is going to be key to evidence that demonstrates um, that, that uh, additional outcomes value can be delivered. We, we see that coming in uh, in medtech, but also a, a broader understanding, and this is something that was uh, captured in a, an interview that we published in the report that I uh, would encourage you to go and look at um, with Jason Ertel from Nottingham Spurk who points out that there's uh, an increased emphasis on home care, and that's moving companies more towards thinking about the real challenge, not in terms of making innovation work at any cost, but at the right cost. Because I think as care has moved more towards the home, and this is something I'll talk a bit more about uh, in a moment, but we've seen much more understanding of the, the ecosystem of care around the patient, um, the uh, emphasis on not just the uh, end users experience, but the experience of the caregivers or parents that they may have, for example, um, looking after their well-being and the, the context in which medical devices work. And I think that's that's really highlighted issues around the convenience of, of devices and how they plug into people's lifestyles uh, and also the, the affordability of them, not just for the patient, but for um, the health systems that, that pay for them. I think we're seeing some joining up of the thinking around you know patient-based care and um, value-based care for the payers and um, as we move towards a kind of a broader contextualization of, of these new products i think we're thinking less in terms of products more in terms of outcomes and uh, we think that innovation is going to have to reflect that you know it's, a product alone isn't enough but it has to be uh, an offering in terms of what it can deliver for the patient and for all the other stakeholders, you know, and it has to be something that's uh, sustainable and affordable as well. And so we see a different emphasis, I think, coming in in innovation. And a lot of this relates to the shift in virtual care, which I'll, I'll talk more about in a minute. But um, another really big point, and I think we, we make this at length in the report, and it's something that we've just been talking about a lot over the last couple of years, is, is really the supply chain and what's going on with supply chain. And, you know, I think headline, everybody knows there was a, a challenges during, pan, during the pandemic, right? And we, we heard this multiple times uh, in 2020 when we'd be talking to clients that there'd be um, 
I guess the, the main overriding thing that we would hear is that just prior to the pandemic, I think companies across the life sciences sector were much less aware of the paths that their own supply chains took. So they knew that the supply chain worked, they knew they were getting the components, they knew they were getting the, the finished pieces and manufacturing that they needed, but they weren't necessarily clear about who all of their suppliers were, or indeed who their suppliers' suppliers were. They didn't necessarily um, have very much transparency within their own organizations around how those networks were working. And, and that came to a head in 2020 because you'd find, um, so if, for example, in one instance, we talked to a company who, you know, 99% of their supply chain was unaffected by COVID, but there was a particular uh, screw that they could no longer access because as it turned out, they were heavily dependent on a single supplier in Asia. And as it turned out, many other companies were also dependent on that supplier. And once they were disrupted and uh, the, the supply was constricted, suddenly this became a huge problem. And it, it really wasn't like a high tech part of their manufacturing. It was a single basic component. But once the supplies were, were hit, um, that really disrupted the entire supply chain. And, and so I think, you know, that was obviously an issue that existed before that we have these very, very highly globalized um, supply chains, not just in this sector, of course, but, but across many sectors, um, which is fine as far as it goes, except that if companies don't know um, exactly who their suppliers are, then you, you immediately run into trouble when there's disruption. Um, and I think, you know, th these things have been somewhat addressed and companies have, have been putting thought into that. But as we come out of, of some of that, uh, you know, COVID related uncertainty, as I say, we're, we're moving into um, other uncertainties which we have on the, the right of this slide. You know, some of the things we've mentioned, the macroeconomic factors, um, there's also, you know, a lot of, you know, volatility um, around things like employment and jobs. Um, and, and I think all of these things mean that the supply chain operating environment hasn't gone back to a, a settled normality such as it was to an extent enjoying in 2018 or 2019. There is still a lot of um, considerations going on. I mean, to, to name an obvious one, there are energy concerns in Europe, particularly as the, um, the Russia-Ukraine situation continues. Um, and I think, you know, something else that's a major thing that we have on, on the left here are just some of the, um, the broader themes that, that predate COVID, but I think it's again ratcheted them up, um, both in terms of, so we've heard a lot about a kind of post-globalization or a shift away from globalization. And um, you, you could probably overstate that, obviously globalization is still very much with us, but we are seeing, uh, you know, some of the global institutions like the WTO playing a reduced role. We're seeing more emphasis on regional or uh, inter-partner trade and less on these huge globalized networks. And, and to some extent, uh, I think this is because of geopolitical tensions that, that pre-exist the, the pandemic. Um, you know, in, in 2019, if we can think back to that, we were talking a lot about um, trade challenges between the US and China and, and potential slapping on of tariffs and trade barriers and the, the tensions involved with that and what that would do to um, globalized supply networks. And I think, you know, clearly these, these tensions in a, a multipolar world still remain and are, are probably worsening. And that's a, an ongoing issue for supply chain. It should also mention sustainability and the, the emphasis on, on bringing sustainability into the supply chain. There's a, a lot more desire to see, you know, circular manufacturing, reusability, um, not just single use items, uh, both in the, uh, the manufacturing stage and in terms of, you know, hospital equipment itself. So I, I think, um, coming out of the pandemic, we still have many of these issues with us, as I say, and they're all things that the industry has to think about. And it, of course, it's not just the industry, it's also governments are, are very involved in supply chain at the moment. And that's uh, the policymaker interventions that we mentioned on this slide that I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. But I, I think, you know, whereas governments may have been content to allow supply chains to continue functioning, uh, self-regulating and, you know, generally um, working satisfactorily as far as they were concerned prior to the pandemic, I think issues around shortages, and that applies not just to, you know, ventilators and PPE, but there were also some odd shortages of generic drugs and of um, different devices that re were reliant on specific 
um, supply components. I think the, the, the public health situation has really compelled governments to think very seriously about, you know, do we need to be more uh, proactive in how we manage supply chain policy? And, uh, you know, I think this is still ongoing and it's still up in the air, but we do see signs that there may be some specific interventions coming. Um, and, you know, I, I think one aspect that's caught everybody's attention is the, the semiconductor supply chain problem. And, you know, th this is mainly, we've, you know, at least my impression is we've mainly been talking about it in terms of high tech and in terms of things like the automotive sector. But uh, the semiconductor market is, is very important for medtech as well, um, even if it's less than 1% of the, the total market for the chips, which is what Advermed, the industry advocacy body, has estimated. So in some cases, the chips are really critical. Um, and, you know, medical devices, you know, much as we haven't necessarily seen the, the kind of digital data revolution yet in the sector, they do routinely rely on um, software and chips. And, you know, this is very true of a lot of uh, current generation hospital equipment. And so, you know, Advermed has, has spoken out about uh, the need to ensure chip supply in the sector, because it's, it's something that may not be thought of as the immediate priority for that kind of tech, but it is actually um, pretty highly dependent on it. So, you know, I think as devices become more complex and they incorporate more components, um, you know, there, there's an increasing overlap of, of med tech and tech per se. And, um, you know, I, I think that's great and it has many opportunities, but it also means that there are vulnerabilities on some of these supply components that wouldn't necessarily um, first come to people's attention. So in terms of this question of resilience and what will governments do to ensure that it continues, um, we've seen a lot of initiatives and also a lot of white papers and talk um, in the US, Europe, and indeed in every region, uh, in, in the US specifically for medical devices, there's the Resilient Supply Chain Program, which is, uh, as it says on the slide, you know, intended to, to, strength, to strengthen public health supply chains and to take a more interventionist, if you like, role in, in running the supply chains and making sure that they are running uh, effectively. But what we don't really know is, is where this will lead. Um, are we going to continue seeing a move away from, uh, you know, widespread globalization of most supply chains and more government control or more government oversight of how supply chains work within specific nations or in specific regions? I think this is a really massive question that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's relevant to many industries, but I think in the life sciences, it's, it's, it's kind of come right up the agenda because governments have started to think in terms of the strategic importance of being able to secure um, medical equipment and drugs, uh, should there be another pandemic, or, or in general, I think, I think the pandemic really just brought it to people's attention that that's a, that's a key function of government. And so there's a lot of, um, discussion around what governments will do in terms of the supply chain and of course the the big uh you know question that everyone asks is, is will there be a push for localization you know actually bringing the supply chains back within for example the us uh instead of sourcing components from around the world and there, there's a lot of talk about that as a as a as a hypothesis for what the industry could attempt um i think it, it probably understates just how uh, diversified and, and how networked supply chains are. But, you know, I, I think even short of things like localization and onshoring, we are likely to see many other government initiatives, and that could include export quotas, which we saw some of during the pandemic. It could include government taking a more um, proactive role in how procurement works or forcing companies towards diversification, for example, so that those situations where there are bottlenecks around particular suppliers can no longer happen, or, for example, not demanding that uh, onshoring happens, but giving R and D credits or incentives, or alternatively, uh, the stick rather than the carrot, restricting market access, uh, dependent on whether companies are doing some part of the manufacturing within that region. So uh, all of these are things that we think are, you know, up for debate and. It's an area where I think the industry needs to keep speaking with policymakers and, and giving its view.
So I, th I think the supply chain question is really broad and interesting um, for, for medtech. It's, it's too early to say what the, the implications are going to be. But I, I think in terms of the, the other end of it, and this is something, again, you know, that's been um, pushed along by the pandemic, we've seen a lot more talk about um, the commercial models. And by this, I'm thinking in terms of how medtech companies go to their, their customers, the, the people who are procuring the devices at the, at the hospital and provider group end. Um, and you know, we've, we've heard during the pandemic that people are making much more use of omni-channel, to, to use the phrase, and um, digital resources to, to make those connections and to carry out some of the activities that they would previously have done face to face. But you know, the, the, the thing we hear from clients is that this is really only the beginning um, of, a, of a journey in terms of that connection with customers, that there's increasingly an emphasis on um, being able to deliver uh, in terms of that virtual or home-based care model, that there's, uh, as I mentioned, you know, much more of a shift towards outcomes-driven or value-driven models. So you will demonstrate the value of the product ongoingly, probably using real-world evidence, rather than simply get the product to market and then and then it's simply a commodity in the market for you. There'll be much more ongoing um, engagement around validating and demonstrating the use of these products, and um, and that digital journey we also see um, not going away, but but being an important part of how um, customer engagement works. And and this is something that you know in a way it's kind of behind the scenes, and you know you don't get uh, med tech companies necessarily talking about this in their in their quarterly reporting. But it it is a, a big um, you know concern for them uh, how they go about doing this right and how they do it better in the future. And I think because we've had to try different things during the pandemic we have some uh, ideas about new approaches that will that will you know transform and refine these commercial models and make them work better and i think you know that's part of this this subject that i keep coming back to which is around the shift in how care works and um i think this is this is you know pretty widely recognized but you know that there has been a big embrace of home-based care um during the pandemic, and obviously things like in the US, uh, the changing of legislation that allowed telehealth to be reimbursed in different states has been really important for that. But we think that the telehealth thing is, while important, only a part of the, the transformation that's happening. We're seeing a, a lot more emphasis on uh, what the Biden administration calls hospital at home um, in the US, and we think that will be the same in Europe as well. Um, Dan Stark uh, of Owens and Minor, who we spoke to in the report, said home care is going to be the place to play in the future, and that that's been accelerated by the pandemic. And I think that there are really obvious reasons for this. I think it's more convenient for patients to access care at home if possible. Um, it, it's better not to go to hospital, um, which is something that the, the pandemic really brought home. That uh, you know, if, if you don't have to, then it's 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 good as, as well to avoid being in a, a hospital setting. And, and increasingly people are recognizing that we have the technology to do remote care, that it's kind of inertia that's stopping a lot of these things being moved towards the home. Um, but because we do now have the, the abilities to, to make that shift, um, I think we're seeing companies take it increasingly seriously. And one, one reflection of that is that we're getting heavier investment into home-based care models. And uh, uh, Laura mentioned the, the mega deal at the end of last year with Baxter paying over 10 billion US dollars for Hillrom, um, which is a connected care specialist, and Baxter, a, a big med tech player, paid that money to acquire these um, capabilities in terms of digital care delivery and connected care solutions. And that's all something that really assists with the, the hospital at home approach. We've seen um, the tech giant Amazon buying one medical. Um, which is, I think, interestingly related to the same um, theme. I think it's it's tech companies thinking through how the, the care delivery model works and thinking that tech can play a role in it. So that's potentially Amazon moving into sort of that, that primary care space. And I think more recently we've seen um, a couple of the, the big provider networks in the US pay serious money for home health care um, you know, uh, specialist companies, so particularly CVS and Signify was a, a huge deal, but we also saw uh, Walgreens buying Carecentrics. And I think there's a, a general move towards embracing this and thinking that virtual care 
uh, is going to be a part, at least, of how care is delivered in the future, and that companies need to get in on that. And I think that's not just a concern for, for tech companies and providers, but also that med techs like Baxter and others need to think about how that's going to work for them. As I say, uh, R&D is going to have to be considered in that context. Is this a device that can offer the patient a convenient experience and that can work in these other contexts where there's not a, a traditional clinical setting or a care team around? Devices that can offer that are probably going to be increasingly important in the future. And um, at EY, we've spoken about the idea of an intelligent health ecosystem uh, emerging. I think at the moment, you know, we, we've moved away from having a very traditional analog, if you like, care model to having pockets of digital care, pockets of um, AI, for example, is, is, is playing an increasingly large role in, in radiology and in other imaging sectors. But, um, you know, while we have some of this going on, we don't yet have a huge uh, exchange of data or a huge um, collaborative ecosystem taking shape within the medtech sector and its stakeholders in the, the provider groups and uh, the other customers it serves. Um, and I think you know the, the long-term vision is that this this evolution towards virtual care is just part of a a, a greater you know interconnection between these different stakeholders and a greater digitally enabled, data-driven um, kind of collaborative approach that they can take a, a more networked model. Um, that we've called the Intelligent Health Ecosystem in a paper we published earlier this year, but that we think is, you know, it, it's clearly uh, the ultimate direction that a lot of these things tend in. It's just a question of companies making the big bets that, that will realize um, some of these steps happening. And I think, there's, there's, as I say, there's always inertia. I think what we saw during the pandemic was that some of these steps which companies have been reluctant to take actually happened at a very fast run in the end because um, while the technologies have existed for some time there had been no real need to roll them out or to deploy them in the real world until there was a pandemic and then there was you know a, a massive need for it um, and it could be the same with some of these other issues um, that we could see um, if there's a, an external trigger for it more urgency to building more interconnection and more digitization and um, I think there's such solid reasons for expecting the, uh, the way that healthcare works to move in this direction, that it's something that we should be constantly looking forward to. When we talk about virtual care and hospital at home now, this is this is just the, the present and we're looking ahead to a future which is going to make this stuff much more, uh, you know, normalised and much more um, advanced. And that's going to become uh, a standard way of working, I think, for medtechs in the sector. And um, the final kind of high level challenge that we want to talk about um, is, is the workforce issue. And of course, the, the, this is true across sectors. There's, there's been the great resignation, as, as people are terming it, with, with people leaving uh, many different industries. It's a huge issue in healthcare. Um, we've seen a lot of people leaving um, healthcare provision, physicians and nurses. Um, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics estimated it was 3% of the workforce leaving per month uh, uh, earlier in 2022, um, which is obviously unsustainable. Um, and, you know, this has big implications for medtech specifically, not because medtechs can't staff their own organizations. I think as Laura mentioned, you know, they're, they're still actually building their headcount, they're still growing. But, um, I think talent shortages at the healthcare provision end are, are really problematic for medtech specifically. And um, to understand that, you only have to think about what was happening in 2020 um, when elective uh, procedures were scaled back or stopped or deferred. Um, it really took a bite out of companies in a lot of those sectors, which are heavily elective surgery driven. So not just dentistry and ophthalmology, but also orthopedics. You know, a lot of those. Um, companies simply weren't seeing take up in 2020 um, because the operations weren't getting done. And, you know, should that uh, again become an issue because there isn't sufficient workforce to keep the volumes of procedures going, then again, that's going to, to weigh on the top lines for med tech companies. Um, but I think there's, there's a, another um, related problem for med techs as well, which is that it's not at present that provider groups uh, are stopping from, you know, are, are failing to provide the same volume of care procedures that they were. They're not stopping. 
But what they are, are happy to do is bring in more contract workers and pay more for their staff and for contractors that they bring in. And, you know, there's some stats on this slide which can capture it, but, you know, regardless, this is a theme that we hear consistently and that you can see um, in the reporting from some of the, the publicly reporting um, provider groups in the US, that the cost of uh, labor is going up. And of course, that then means that there's uh, a potential restriction on capital costs and that can eat into procurement for equipment and for medical devices. And so I think, you know, indirectly as well, this, this becomes a huge challenge for the sector. And that's uh, something that has to be addressed. Um, and, and in terms of how Meditech addresses that, you know, it, it can work to retain its own talent, it can help to provide the tech solutions that can support providers and, you know, it also improve the care experience for staff as well as for patients, which may help retention. Um, and then, you know, we, we've said Meditech needs to think about this, um, you know, increased focus on virtual care delivery, it has to rethink its R&D to deliver for that you know, emergent ecosystem, which is different to the traditional care model. Um, it's going to have to think continually in, into the future about supply chain resilience and supply chain visibility. And um, I think that's going to be pushed by policymakers as well. And then finally, these, these consumer centric value based um, commercial models are also going to be a priority. I think all of these themes are, are things that we're hearing loud and clear from clients that we think are, are kind of top of mind for the industry and that uh, as we move forward are going to be um, operational pieces that they need to tackle. Um, so I, I'm going to wrap it up there. I hope we've given you a, a good overview of the metrics for the industry and uh, some of the thematic um, changes that we've seen this year and the challenges we see ahead. Um, I don't know if we have any additional questions, but if so, I'd be happy to answer those in the couple of minutes we have left. Thank you, James and Thank Laura, you. for um, such an interesting uh, presentation and for sharing lots of um, great insights. We have had a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is, I'm curious about the VC map with California and Massachusetts leading. Mm -hmm. Why is it that Japan does not feature? It's a large enough economy with a healthy life sciences med tech sector do you do they do things differently perhaps yeah no well yes they do do things differently but quite simply the um the pulse report is focused on the us and europe um hence when laura shows the revenue slide we break it down by us and european companies but we um don't incorporate the asian companies into these estimates of the market or of the financing so yeah the um the the, the boston tech hub and the bay area are are the biggest in the us and europe there are, um, you know, very large financing um, opportunities in Asia, and you know, indeed, there's kind of the startup um, ecosystem emerging in China uh, to an extent. But that's outside the scope of our report, so that's that's the reason for that. Great, thank you, James. I think we can squeeze in one more question before sure. we finish. Thank you to those that did send in questions. Um, so it would be great to have the quick comment, comments from the speakers about what med tech companies should pay attention to when facing both Brexit and the remaining hectic of COVID, be it UK companies expanding to outside the UK or vice versa? Yeah, well, I, I think Brexit, um, you know, obviously it has some bearing on the supply chain question, but I think you know, in general, I think the themes that I've pulled out, I, I think are applicable in the UK and elsewhere. I think um, we've, had, I mean, the way that I've talked about some of these things is quite US centric, simply because as I say, that's the center of gravity for the industry. But we've seen the same rise in telehealth and, you know, emphasis on remote care in the UK. Um, we know about the, the burden on the NHS um, and the desirability of being able to move some care away from traditional care centers if it can you know uh, alleviate the volume of, uh, of uh, procedures that are falling on the, the physician uh, workforce and nurses um, and so I think all of these themes will be relevant there um, I, I wouldn't like to uh, <laughs> wouldn't like to speak to the, the brexit implications for some of the macroeconomic headwinds that we're talking about but uh, you know I, I think it, it's all part of this this broader uncertainty um,
in terms of the, the broad operating environment. And I think that's, um, you know, Brexit is the British version, but I think there are, there are similar concerns in many different markets and it's, it's all part of negotiating that, that I think is, is causing us to flag these issues for companies as, as things they can address that, that can build resilience and improve their models for the future. Brilliant. Well, thanks again, James and Laura, and thank you to everybody that attended today's session. Uh, we will be back at half past one with our innovation showcase, and I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, thank you for joining. Enjoy the rest of the conference. If you do want to follow up with EY, their colleague Ruby uh, Sharoon Khan is attending, um, so you can contact her via the app um, if you have any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Al.